Um, good morning to everyone and welcome to History Matters and So Does Coffee. Um, today, we are going to be talking about, in a, and I'll go more into this in more detail in a moment, we're going to be talking about um, teaching standards, Florida teaching standards, but bigger bigger than that. We're going to be talking one way or another about framing. And then I found some very interesting stuff about early American textbooks, which I'm going to throw in here, which I, I didn't know before this morning in this particular way. So, but I'm going to stop talking right now. And instead, I will turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who will explain the rules of the game. Well, good morning, Joanne, and good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Annie Evans from New American History, and I love gathering with everyone here on Fridays. You guys have already started a very active chat, those of you who are Zooming in with us. Um, but if you have questions, and this, this topic I know will generate a lot of great questions, you'll want to look down uh, towards the bottom of your screen and put those in the Q&A. In about 30 minutes, I will be back in and we will handle some of those questions. So I'll see you just in a little bit. Wonderful. Um, and I will also add that, um, and I believe this we just said, see, this, I'm not good at numbers. This is the 176th straight episode. Um, at any rate, uh, I will add uh, that any of you Thank you, Carly. Yes, 176. Um, that if any of you are here for the first time, please say something. Um, make sure that your comments are going to all participants uh, and tell folks uh, because our community here, given all of those episodes that we've done together, is amazing and you will be warmly welcomed by the History Matters community if you tell us that you're here for the first time. Okay, now, um, so I, I've been I've been thinking, uh, thinking partly with you and thinking partly um, because of the podcast episode that I did this last week um, about Florida, about the teaching standards. Um, and we've talked before, I went back as I ever do, because with 176 episodes, uh, I am now very prone to forget have I ever talked about something. And in, with this topic, I know in recent weeks, in one way or another, I've been approaching, I talked about bad history and I've talked about teaching standards in, in one way or another. I wanted to um, touch on a point, a broader point that um, I think gets lost in some of the larger discussion that's been going on regarding Florida's um, particularly African-American history teaching standards, but actually more broadly, their teaching standards, because uh, there's another point in there that um, I think is highly problematic and hasn't gotten any attention at all. Um, but I also, in as ever this morning, in doing my research to see what I specifically wanted to talk about, um, I found interesting material on early American textbooks. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And I even have the specific article that I use. It's really interesting. And so I bet um, some of you are going to want to see it. And um, you are all so remarkably fast at, at finding things when I mention them, like talk about poof, poof, someone finds it online. So, um, oh, and I see Jessica just posted, I see, I can't look at it now, but there's an NCHE statement about it, which is wonderful. And I encourage you to look at it. Um, the, the point that I wanted to make, and here I actually have like so many pages of notes today um, because of that last minute thing. So let me get past all the last minute stuff. Okay. Um, so I'll just very briefly for those who haven't been here for our previous conversations. Um, on July 19th, Florida um, offered a new set of uh, Black history teaching standards. Uh, it was actually approved by the state on July 19th. It's a 216 page document. Um, it's online, you can look at it. And I will say that's a good thing. You know, it could have been sneaky or something and it, 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 it's not sneaky, it's there. You can't be sneaky if you're gonna offer it to teachers and force them to comply by it. But at any rate, I encourage you to go look at it, read it yourself draw your own conclusions. The point that has received lots and lots and lots and lots of attention is one single point. Um, and mostly it's 
I think ninth through 12th grade teaching, um, I don't want to call them suggestions, but subjects and clarifications, meaning what to, what to focus on. Um, so ninth through 12th grade, one of these subjects says, um, and this is directly from the document, um, examine the various duties and trades performed by slaves, enslaved people, um, for example, agricultural work, painting, carpentry, tailoring, domestic service, blacksmithing, transportation. And then the clarification says, instruction includes how slaves develop skills, which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. Now, that got all of the attention. Um, and for good reason, it got a lot of attention. But because of that, to me, the larger question of the framing of these standards overall has kind of gotten lost in the public discourse. And that's equally problematic and actually ties in. I just saw across, I'm trying not to, I try very hard not to read what people are saying on the bottom of the screen because your comments appear. Um, but I saw someone mention the Prager U videos, um, which, also have their own rather distinctive way of looking at American history in a way that I would not want in my classroom. And again, part of the problem, part of the problem is factual, but more than that, the problem is framing. How do you frame what you're saying? So there are any number of things in the Florida standards that individually one could say, well, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. There was an article, I believe, in National Review uh, in which someone sort of went ticking, you know, point by point by point in the Florida standards saying, well, this is true. Well, this is true. Well, this is true. And that's particularly why it's not useful to see this as an exercise in fact checking, although accuracy and fact checking is very important. But the problem, the overall problem, and the statement about personal benefit and skills as part of the larger framing, the framing of the standards again and again and again tries to um, downplay the severity of American slavery. Um, so I'm trying to find some examples here. Um, okay, so for example, um, this is one of the clarifications. Um, instruction includes the similarities between serfdom and slavery, and emergence of the term slave in the experience of Slavs. Now, if I'm teaching about American slavery, that's not my top 10 list. Um, the beginning of the word slave and the experience of Slavs. Again and again and again and again, the, the standards are saying, oh, but look, it was really bad in the Caribbean. Oh, but look, it was in Asia. Hey, Europeans learned about slavery in Africa again and again and again. And when I briefly talked about this on one of 500 social media platforms, people responded by saying, well, it's important to understand slavery in a broader context, yes. And it's important to acknowledge that slavery didn't just happen in the United States, yes. And you can also say that the slavery in the United States was not the most extreme form of slavery. It was crueler uh, and, and deadlier in the Caribbean for the most part. So all of these things are true. That said, it's the larger framing, which you only get if you read through everything that this document says. And in some cases, like slaves and, and the Slavs, um, facts that are in there that are sort of planted there, interestingly, and don't appear to be central to understanding slavery, uh, either on a worldwide basis or an American basis. And then partly, again, just the way in which um, whenever anything negative is mentioned about American slavery, there's some other thing yoked in. You know, it was bad for white people too in Virginia, say the standards, right? Talk about how bad it was for white people in the South in this time period. Okay, framing. Framing, that's in a sense what I wanna be talking about here this morning. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in a moment um, in referring to early American textbooks. Um, so framing is the larger problem. And I encourage you, um, this 
is not a a caution or even a suggestion that applies only to the Florida standards. Um, and as I said a moment ago, I'm not saying that facts don't matter. I'm not saying that accuracy doesn't matter. But I am saying that just as um, when we listen to or read or see some information news whiz by us on a TV screen or on a computer screen or on the radio or in a newspaper or wherever, we really need to think about who is offering it, why they're offering it, what is included in it, in whatever we're reading or seeing, what isn't included in the same way that, and I know a lot of you are teachers and you already know this, but I feel the need to say it anyway, um, in the same way that we have to evaluate information that comes by us. And as I, again, have said 5 million times, if something you see or read, piece of information, excites a lot of emotion in you, pause for a moment to consider whether the person offering it to you wants you to have a really strong emotion. Is this rage harvesting by someone who will be helped by um, getting a particular group of people either enraged or showing them responding strongly or whatever? There's any number of ways in which rage can serve partisan purposes. But in the same way as we all need to evaluate the framing, the context, the point, the motives behind any information that we read, obviously we need to do that in the case of teaching standards and textbooks. And that's, to me, part of the infuriating part of what I saw, particularly when this topic was really at the top of the news. And now, um, more recently, the Prager University videos have sort of taken the place, but are still part of the same conversation. Um, there, I, I didn't, and some of you may know, and if you do know, please post it um, in the chat. Some of you may know um, of, of a place where pe people were talking about the larger framing and what it is teaching students to think about American slavery, not uh, on the basis of individual facts, but in a broader way. How bad was it? Was it bad? How do we think about American slavery? That's the larger question. And if the framing is suggesting not as bad as you might think, that might not be the primary message I want my students to understand if I'm teaching them about American slavery. World context, good. Reality's good. Bad other places, good. But think about the priorities of what you want students to know, what you want them to come away from, what narrative and what point of view might you be pushing depending on the framing. Now, um, and I have all other examples from, um, actually I'll mention one other example from the Florida standards and then I'll go on to early America, which I, again, I discovered this morning. I find it very interesting in ways that one might not expect. And I think shed interesting light on what's going on in Florida right now. The one other point I want to make, and I don't know if it's been discussed at all, and again, I haven't seen it, doesn't mean it hasn't been discussed at all. Um, where is it? Here we go. Um, that throughout the teaching standards, uh, and this is a quote from the Florida document, students will identify the United States as a constitutional republic. Now, this is unending, right? And I've had this conversation in which I say the United States is a democratic republic. And someone responds and says, well, we're a constitutional republic. And then I respond and say, yeah, and our constitution creates a democratic form of government. We're a democratic republic. And it's, it's never ending. And what's significant about this point, and that's mentioned several times in this document, we're a constitutional republic. We're a constitutional republic. By removing the word and by aggressively removing the word democratic or democracy, you're downplaying the fact that this is a government where the majority rules, right? If we're a constitutional republic, the constitution rules and we're not thinking about majorities or for that matter, necessarily even voting, if we're a democratic republic, we're a republic where we, the people, the majority, rules. It's a rhetorical shift, but there are deeper implications involved. Um, and for some people, not all people who are claiming that the United States is a constitutional republic, but for some, they're very happy to see democratic, not because it's the party, but just democracy and democratic 
eliminated. What one person said to me, and again, this is highly anecdotal, when I asked why, why all the trouble with the word democracy or democratic? And this one particular random person, so not representative of, any, of anything, said something along the lines of, I, I think democracy isn't, the, the, I don't remember the word he or she used, but it was like, is, is lowly, right? Something about democracy is like not, not something admirable, which kind of stunned me. Um, but at any rate, uh, that's one random person. Um, we're a democratic republic governed under a constitution, or we're a constitutional republic, which is democratic. Um, in one way or another, democracy is central to what we are as a nation and removing that word from the way we discuss and describe our nation has a larger political motive in mind. Otherwise there wouldn't be such a doggone <laughs> consistent attempt to strip the word democratic away. And, you know, I encourage you, uh, this would be, you know, probably for um, maybe for an undergrad or graduate student to track um, that this sort of evolution of, of democratic republic or democracy and how we describe the United States and how that's evolved, I'd say, I don't know, in the last 10 or 15 years. At any rate, so I had to mention that because that drives me up a tree um, as someone who writes and, and studies the founders and the constitution uh, and has been arguing about this for a long time. But okay, the, the other point I want to move to here, I don't want to run out of time. So I... Um, in, in researching this morning, right, I, I we've talked a little about Florida before. Um, we talked a little bit in one way or another about framing before. And I was doing what we all do as scholars and historians and asking myself questions. Huh, so I wonder how this compares with dot, dot, dot. And I don't know how I got to it, but at some point, I am an early American historian. I thought, well, you know what? What, what are early American textbooks like? I know that um, textbooks in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, I've seen discussion of them, I've seen articles about them, you're moving then into the realm of, um, this name went right out of my head, um, dictionary, die, the name went out of my head, someone provided on the bottom of the screen there, Webster, thank you, um, Webster's textbooks and McGuffey readers and all of that stuff. Um, I have read about that. I hadn't read as much about the equivalent of textbooks, again, not like ours, but still being used in schools as textbooks from an earlier period. Now, I expected, and I know that um, I've had students, undergrad, maybe not grad, but undergrad students write about children's books in early America before the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. And I assumed that what they would find was um, a big emphasis on, um, because we're talking about the period when the United States is first becoming the United States. I assumed we would see ideas and images and, and symbols and text about nationalism, about small r republicanism, that there would be um, a sort of broad nationalistic message saying, look, we're a great new nation and here. What's interesting about these textbooks, um, and I assume something the same, right? Because I've read Benjamin Rush. Um, I've read uh, any number of people in this time period who from an elite level, and this is an, going to be an important distinction in a moment, on an elite level, political elite folk talked a lot about the importance of education in a republic, that if the public is in charge in a democratic republic where the people govern, they need to be educated. They need to understand their government. They need to understand the lessons that history has to teach about the fragility of republics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's a high level conversation of that. And they, it's connected to um, what is American, how is American different from you know, new world versus old world, American versus European. There's, a, there's an elite conversation going on like that. Um, but when you get down on the ground level, that's not what you're seeing. And this is what I found interesting this morning. And I wanna say that the, the next few minutes of my discussion come from an article titled, um, Contested Identities, 
Nationalism, Regionalism, and Patriotism in Early American Textbooks. It's by Margaret A. Nash. It's in History Education Quarterly. Um, and it's about textbooks from 1783 to 1815, which is an interesting early period to do this, um, basically from the end of the American Revolution through the War of 1812, not the period most people look at when they're looking at early American, early-ish American textbooks. Um, and what she finds in her study of these books is that they're not necessarily making, they're not as nationalistic uh, as she might have expected and as I might have expected, that many of them in one way or another are local. They're written on a local level. They talk about local issues that to some degree they're sectional, although they're not so much focused on section as they as Americans would come to be later. They are, and this is the part that I found interesting, so let me find it here. Um, okay, uh, this was particularly related to today's conversation, what I found interesting. They criticize slavery. Huh, imagine that. Um, that they're open and critical. Um, that in there, and this is true, a lot of the textbooks do come from the North, not all of them, but the, the books that we're describing as textbooks are Northern in this period. Um, but generally speaking, um, these texts criticize the institution of slavery, criticize individuals who own enslaved people, criticize the entire institution. Um, slavery, according to the author of one text, quote, is utterly abhorrent to good policy, to morality, and to the spirit of Christianity. Um, many of these books talk about ideas about liberty and freedom that are central in the minds of many Americans, given the revolution and Americans' views about the British monarchy, and they don't hesitate to make a connection between the fact that Americans are focused on rights and liberty and they're enslaving other people. So for example, um, one book uh, by Jedediah Morris, which is kind of a well-known one, that one I knew about before reading this, says, um, over a million degraded people are still held in slavery in this land of liberty and equal rights. Another one is even more assertive and says, nor is there any hope that this dismal stain will be washed away till the slaves by the destruction of their masters shall rise to freedom. Imagine that. The only way to overcome slavery is if the enslaved people rise and fight for themselves in a textbook in early America. Um, and what's interesting is, so Nash really wants to evaluate this and she, she chips away at things one might assume. So one might assume, for example, that the textbooks written by Northerners it's assumed they're only going to be used in the North, so maybe that's why this is going on, except that that's largely not true. Um, Southerners were slower to create their own textbooks than Northerners, um, so Northerners assumed, for time at least, that Southerners would probably be using these textbooks as well. Um, so, so in essence, what I'm saying here is it, that this discussion of slavery is not because Northerners didn't think Southerners would see the books. Um, they assumed Southerners would see the books and they were pretty blunt in criticizing and describing the institution of slavery, attacking its morality, talking about the ways in which it violates fundamental American ideas about freedom and rights. Now, that said, and this is very typical of this period. I don't think the word democracy is actually in the title for this article, but interestingly, democracy doesn't always fare really well <laughs> in these textbooks. It's, it's seen as something important. Um, let's see if I have some good quotes here. Um, there, there are quotes about the glories of democracy, but there are all kinds of statements, and, and again, this is an early period, so the Republic, the early Republic is still very un, untested, untried, brand new. Um, the textbooks say things like, democratic elections inspire a high sense of personal independence and a jealous care of national freedom, but they also destroy the necessary distinctions in society and put all men on a level divide the community into political parties and in a great measure break up between them the common civilities of life. So yeah, democracy is important, but it does some bad things. Another textbook says democracy might lead to government run by people who aren't capable of 
running a government very well. Um, one textbook says, um, if you don't have education, you can't really have democracy. Um, so it says, for example, in Virginia, that there are schools, they don't, are not very many schools, their educational system is not to be compared with New England. And so this textbook says, uh, in Virginia, the poor are ignorant and have little concern with politics, the government, therefore, though nominally Republican, Virginia is really oligarchical. Fascinating. Um, at any rate, um, oh, and one last point, uh, that these textbooks talk about why republics are important, um, and but they don't say um, the American Republic uh, is unique in the world, exceptional, and we are the only people you should ever look to. The textbooks in a kind of Enlightenment-esque kind of way essentially say, and I believe I took down a quote here, um, maybe I did not, that, Amer that Americans should be allied with any republic, right? That, that the United States is a republic, it's a good republic, it's not necessarily the best and only republic, and that where republics exist around the world in a sense that, that encourages universal principles in some way or another about rights, Americans should ally with those nations as well. Um, they, the textbooks also caution that democracy is fragile, um, there are dangers inherent in it, um, that liberty, freedom, and justice are not inherent in the American system, but need to be preserved and fought for, um, that they can exist elsewhere. Um, so in one way or another, these early American textbooks are critical of things like slavery openly and talk about uh, in a general way, it's the fact that it is immoral and immoral institution. Um, again, there, there's local components to them. Um, but they're not saying America is better than everyone else and ignore the rest of the world. They're saying, well, no, actually, there are certain principles and ideals that are good. And if countries abide by those, then it would serve us well to support those kinds of countries. So if you're if you're if people are saying, you know, we're going back to the good old days of uh, teaching about America and race and slavery and the ways that the founding generation did well. The founding generation, not every single book that was used as a textbook, but a lot of them was pretty open about talking about slavery as a bad institution, uh, as something to be ashamed of. Uh, and there wasn't the sort of weird, no one should be uncomfortable reasoning, uh, or at least white children shouldn't be uncomfortable reasoning that we see uh, today when we think about teaching about slavery and race. Okay, I'm two minutes over. Um, anyway, I found that um, I found that really fascinating. And I encourage you, the article is really interesting and talks about any number of different things that were found in these textbooks. Um, I bet in a lot of ways that would be of interest to you folks and might even be something of interest in a classroom situation to show students what textbooks looked like in this very early period before you get the sort of more mass produced mid 19th century um, Noah Webster-y, uh, now that his name is back in my head, textbooks. That this says something about early America, but and what it shows is that it's localized, that people have a national sensibility, but not like America first necessarily. It's like America is good. It's, it's a pretty good constitution. Let's see what happens. Um, and let's try and be the best us that we could possibly be. Um, more um, complex and more subtleties um, than one would necessarily expect in 1790 Vermont. Actually, there were there was some sniping too. I, I, I will finish in a moment, but I can't resist the sniping. Um, they were kind of local. Uh, and so some of the books did snipe at people from other states. Um, so for example, uh, Morse, Jedediah Morse, who's a pastor from Massachusetts, says, residents of Rhode Island are ignorant, irreligious, and loose in their morals. <laughs> Another New England minister says that people in New Hampshire indulge in the too free use of spiritous liquor. So this was like 
New Englanders attacking other New Englanders. It's somehow not surprising that Americans can always find ways to attack other Americans for something having to do with morality or ideals. Anyway, okay. I haven't even seen Mug 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 on the bottom of the screen. Um, it's probably been there and I've been too wrapped up in what I'm talking about here, but um, this mug will make sense. Thank you, Carolee and Julia. Okay. Um, this mug will make sense. It's I, I know I realized I used the AP history mug from the NCHD conference in the last week or two, um, but I have another mug that's useful and it's telling about the South, Ooh. which is pretty much in one way or another part of what we're talking about. Certainly when we're talking about Florida, it's part of what we're talking about. This is from a conference, I think my 1994, I think my first year in grad school at UVA. Um, and I think I gave a still paper. have it. <laughs> Pardon? And you still have it. That must have moved with you several it's a times. Mug. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mug from 1994. Anyway, okay. Um, I will I will stop talking and we can uh oh and I'll open the chat. We can well the chat has been as as always very active. Um and we've got some good questions. Um all right. So George Tonkin asks, um do we know how many people were enslaved in Florida by 1860? I do not total have total population. Right. I do not have um, those numbers. George, um, I have a map that can give you those numbers for all the Southern states. So I will pop the map in the chat in a few minutes um, for you. Okay. Will that work for you? Sure. <laughs> I'll okay. show you. And, and I can also... I think Tim will probably get me the total population of Florida in 1860 faster because he's usually much faster with links. But I, I will get some happen. numbers, but not that number. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like I think there were four million enslaved people in the United States in 1860 or something. Anyway, I, I have random numbers. But we have it broken down on this particular map by um, literally by the county in each state, so okay. pretty specific. So you can look at individual counties. Okay. Um, so that will be coming up. Um, Dave asks, will Yale or University of, Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison or Twin Cities be reluctant to accept students from states where students are taught or not taught in high school is either wrong or incomplete? How will what high school students are not taught impact public state institutions so I would I would imagine it's not just Yale or schools in Minnesota. I think we're all going to be wondering: yeah. Will students coming from those states not be accepted to universities in states where they mandate you teach the full and complete history? Which is a really good question. Um, to me, that's a two part question. One part is: What are the schools? What are universities going to do about this, if anything? Um, and you know, my totally random hunch is initially they won't do anything about it. They'll just take students from wherever, which means part two of the question is we as teachers will be dealing with it so that, you know, I assume in my lecture courses and in my seminars, there will come a point at some point where there will be some things I assume students know that they don't or that they know something know something really interesting that I would not assume they do. So, you know, I think the first the, the front of this particular form of cultural warfare is going to be teachers um, who will be seeing it and and if it how it does or doesn't impact what students assume to be true, what they need to be taught. Um, and I, you know, I can't speak for universities. I have no idea. It's a really, really interesting question. What do you do um, if you have students from a, you know, and let's say that what we're seeing now continues and becomes more extreme so that you, you down the road you know that if a student is in secondary school in Florida they just aren't learning about x y and z what do you do I you know I mean we can talk about the problems of that we can talk about the blinders that it creates we can talk about the ways in which it fosters a partisan view of things and the ways in which it whitewashes history but what a university does about that I think remains to be seen um, and it'll probably be different universities doing different things until enough of them do something that everyone else jumps on the bandwagon. I don't know. Um, I have no way to answer that question, but it's a really good question. Yeah. All right. 
I, I'm curious to see how that's all gonna. Yeah. So, all right. Um, the next one comes from Sydney, our one of our favorite students. I can't say our favorite student because now we got Claire in here with us today as well. But uh, Sydney wanted us to know she almost missed us today because she overslept. But she is here, and we are delighted. <laughs> Uh, I told her we, with now that we have Claire and Sydney, we can start a collegiate chapter of history. Oh, Network. excellent. Oh, yay. So, okay. I, and I want to say, I would, actually, I shouldn't say this because I'm going to be just asking people. What I was about to say is, if you oversleep, you should still go to class and I won't shame you if you come to my class and you're late. That said, I, I don't want to be like, come to <laughs> We would like you to be there the whole time. Yeah, I would really like you to be there the whole time. But, but being um, there part of the time is better than none of the time. But, but Sydney came and acknowledged the oops. That's like excellent. Yep. All right. Uh, so Sydney's question is, is it constitutional or unconstitutional to control the education system to promote your own political agenda? Well, um, constitutional or unconstitutional that's you know does the constitution say no you can't do that no right i mean we do have in a general way and we're watching it happen in florida a local a state level um organization of what are these standards within a given state um i think in the question here is and i don't have the answer to it um I don't think the answer is there will be national standards imposed because that opens a different door, right? Depending on who's in power on a national level and what they're going to impose. Um, so I, I don't think there's an explicit part of the constitution that says this shouldn't happen. Um, but as with anything else in American society that is partisan and becomes hyper-partisan and it, particularly in the current day becomes part of some kind of culture war, um, it can't be ignored. It needs to be addressed. We need to be part of the decision process. We need to stand up and confront people who are insisting that things do or don't belong in a cur curriculum and actually have conversations rather than mandates and people being just randomly removed from power. You know, there are many things that we could argue about if we were capable right now of arguing and we're not because many people are just saying and I read something this morning actually and it was all I could do not to respond people on the left are evil here's what they're doing and I thought to myself okay I'm not actually going to say people on the right are evil I don't agree with them I don't like a lot of what they're thinking but if that's your starting point you're not going to really be able to have a good faith discussion or even argument so that's a different conversation, um, but that's a that's a problem, and so that's a problem that that is encompassing educational standards because we can't have a discussion about that. We can't put people in a room and have them argue. We can't have real, you know, even school board meetings now. The people there's a you know people showing up in packs to have an impact in some way rather than wanting to come as a group and sort of talk things through. Um, I have no solution to that, but yeah, it's pretty pretty sad state um, when you have to hire extra security guards for your school board meeting. Yeah, yeah, which is happening a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, our good friend Gloria is with us. Hi, Gloria. Um, Gloria is asking: John Adams felt the majority could be tyrannical. Should not the definition of democracy include minority rights? Well, for sure. I, I mean, actually, James Madison thought about this as well, right? That you can have a tyrannical minority. They didn't deny that. Um, you know, uh, well, again, this is the most obvious thing to say in the world. Democracy is complicated, right? Um, that you can have a domineering majority and then you can have a tyrannical minority. And both of those things are of concern. And the fact that democratic modes of government allow for that kind of seesaw of power is one of the vulnerabilities of a democratic mode of government. It, it is. So yeah, it's not great if there's a tyranny of the minority. It's not necessarily great. There you go. Um, Lauren says, tyranny comes in different forms. 
totally does. Um, at any rate, no, you can have tyranny in a lot of different ways. And where you know, I won't go into great detail on this, but we're seeing a lot of examples of tyrannical behavior, um, not necessarily from a majority. Uh, so it can be in many ways, and it's not necessarily good. I mean, tyranny is, I didn't, actually, that's a really interesting, maybe that'll be a future episode is that I start at one of my definition episodes, look up tyranny and talk a little bit about what that means. If, if I forget that, Annie, you have to. I will remind you, Gloria and I will both remind you, won't we, Gloria? Um, but that's a good Coming soon. That's right. Tyranny, what does it mean? Yep. All right. So, um, oh, I think there's more a question for me than you. They're asking, Annie, is there a user guide for bunk? We are working on instructional videos awesome. and how to guides, but many of the lessons do kind of go through that. So, I will, um, if you uh, put your email to me in the chat or just email me, I'll put my email in there. Um, I can help you out. It can seem a little overwhelming. When I first saw Bunk, I thought it was like nerd Pinterest. <laughs> and I love the fact that, that I say, tyranny, interesting. And tyranny. <laughs> in a nanosecond, Tim is like, article, yeah. nature oh. tyranny. <laughs> it's like he's got like this his brain thinks and links or something. So yeah. I love this community for that, right? That reason. I know. Okay, our good friend Ellen um, says in the Houston Independent School Districts, there is a big protest because they are turning some of the libraries into disciplinary centers. So yeah. those schools will no longer have a library or a librarian. That is sad. That's horrible. Thus, um, the attack on libraries from the historical perspective, examples from history where libraries were eliminated or curtailed. That is really sad. It's sad and it's. Um symbolically and, and and in the realm of realism if if you're closing libraries school libraries and they're disciplinary centers and there's no librarian um in the same way that um certain teaching standards can just trim away part of american history and say oh it doesn't exist this is another way to dismiss ways of getting knowledge yeah you know, it it on a on a visceral level, again and again and again, it feels as though what people are saying without saying it is knowledge is scary. Knowledge can reveal bad things. Knowledge can make you feel bad about things that happened in the past. Knowledge, who knows what we're gonna find out if we learn things. Um, yeah. Uh, so to me, the, you know, it's an obvious thing to say, but I'll say it anyway, if you're closing libraries and firing or not hiring librarians, you're finding another way to, in one way or another, stifle knowledge. And, you know, there are many, many ways in which what we see now um, breaks my heart. The In the realm of books, I remember how much books meant to me when I was a kid. You know, like if times were bad, if I felt miserable, whatever was going on, I could have a book. And the book took me away. And books revealed things and showed me other worlds and gave me a sense of possibilities and trained my imagination and trained my intelligence. I mean, I just still... And I bet many of you do too, have a visceral memory of the excitement of having either a new book or even more than that, going to a library. And I know I've talked about this before, but Yorktown Heights, where I grew up, we had a bookmobile. Shrub Oaks was the real library. And, and we would go to Shrub Oaks and we would be allowed to take out a certain number of books. And I will never forget what that felt like, right? It's a big library. Five. Well, five at a time. But we had five kids in our family. So technically we could get 25 every two. I was gonna say you gotta get strategic that way. We how, were. how amazingly exciting that was. And then the idea you have a book, you know, and you you're starting a book as a kid and you don't know where it's gonna take you, the excitement and the ways in which that opens minds. Um I, I would just bet a, a majority of us 
have a gut sense of that. And the fact that that is being shut down because knowledge might be scary, among the many things breaking my heart, that's that's one. I hope that the Houston Public Library gets a bookmobile and parks it right across the street from the school. Right, right. That's what I would do. I don't want to, I don't want to deprive any child of the excitement of exploring and finding books. Yeah. That's it. I would even help pay for the bookmobile to park across. The street. <laughs> I would send <laughs> money to donate to crowdsource a GoFundMe for that. Right. There was like a movement like fund the bookmobile. I mean, they have the little free libraries. Put one of those across the street. Put a bookmobile across the street. A, a bookmobile would be better. The little, yeah. the little free libraries. People are going and well, taking. People can books vandalize. Out. Yeah. They are. They've been vandalizing them and and taking out books and putting Bibles in them. Um, I read something about that. So you want somewhere that's actually going to have a selection of books that will be there. Librarian um, on wheels. Exactly. Exactly. So the other thing, Joanne, that we had here in Charlottesville that I loved, it was called Books on Bikes. And it was in the summer. And so we had these awesome, very energetic elementary librarians and they got these racks that fit over the back wheel. So they had each had two baskets and there were three of them and they would pedal into the communities where kids didn't have a lot of books oh. in our Title I schools. And, and they would bring, um, one person had a cooler mounted to the back and the others had books in these baskets. Wow. They would pedal in, give the kids popsicles and they would sit on the curb and read to them and then pedal to the next neighborhood and they did like oh, two or three of these every week in the summer oh together. i love that what a great idea i sent them money i still send them money because i you know even though i don't work there anymore because it's such a good idea so and there's other cities that do it too but um i love the books on bikes program all right um let's see we've got some more questions we have one from our good friend jen who has been putting some teaching tips in the chat for people who right. are facing this type of censorship in their classroom. So I also do want to say that. briefly, Richard says hi, late checking in because he was on grandpa duty. So I just want to say hi to Richard. Okay, now we can go on. Grandpa duty is important. Okay, Jen says, um, how recently were textbooks still referring to the Civil War as the War of Northern Aggression? And how has that framing impacted things like an affinity for the Confederate flag? Um. I don't, again, I don't have specific years for that, but I can say, because I remember um, a colleague of mine, another another grad student of mine in grad school wrote a paper about something along these lines. Um, this is a topic that there will be articles about. I know that there has been scholarship done on Southern textbooks, modern era Southern textbooks, um, and how they portrayed things like the lost cause um, and the war of northern aggression or whatever else so that would be an area i could see tim is like <laughs> he's gonna go find them but i would bet this would be an area where um others will have done that research and it would be a fascinating topic to delve into <laughs> jonathan says history matters and so do grandpas yes <laughs> oh that'd be a great mug carolee's already left because she had a doctor's appointment but carolee could make a great <laughs> great mug out of that um, I'll make sure that's in the chat transcript when I send it to her later tonight. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, and also, Jen, I put a link there. Uh, there's tons of articles about the textbooks and what was put into ones in different. Uh, there's one tag that has several articles linked to it that I put in the chat all about the textbooks. Um, okay, my good friend Jennifer in Chicago is here. Hi, Jen. Um, Jennifer asks, do you think there will be a trial about history standards similar to the 1920 Scopes trial? Ooh. Ooh. Um, I don't, I, I, I sometimes will say, you know, I'm a historian. I don't, I'm not in the business of predictions, but wouldn't that be fascinating, right? I mean, so I've talked before about, um, courts, classrooms, and culture as being three ways in which political battles tend to get fought out, particularly by people who are losing political power. They fight in courts, um, classrooms, and culture. Um, and this is one of those questions that would kind of bring several of those modes together. It, it would be fascinating. I mean, if I were a future historian, and I discovered that in the period that we're in, there ended up being a court case that was confronting basic information that we teach in schools um, in this period, that would be like 
that would generate more dissertations and books <laughs> than one could count. You know, we can still, in this country, in a general way, rely on our judicial system to uphold some standard of justice still. Um, it, it, it wavers uh, depending on who is being tried uh, in a variety of ways, depending on how much power they have and sometimes depending on what race they are. But still, our judicial system um, still is a place where we can at least pursue justice and try cases with some expectation that there will that justice will be served and that's going to be really vitally important to preserve and not to erode as we go forward because increasingly as people's trust in the national government and national institutions continue to be chipped away sometimes deliberately uh, by people the the legal system is going to be more and more and more front and center yeah, Clinton just put an interesting PBS link. Uh, so, so maybe we can watch that this weekend. Thanks, Clinton. Clinton always puts good links in there too. Uh, oh, so Jessica Ellis is with Ellis is with us, the NCHE uh, president. Is it director or president? I always forget your title, Jessica. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, she's the one that is like responsible for all of us behaving. So um, she has a good question. Jessica is asking, what can teachers in states without these restrictions and legislation like Minnesota do to support teachers in places like Florida? It's easy to sink into our bubble or feel helpless in the face of educational tyranny. Now, now number one, that's a really important question. Um, executive director, Jessica's the executive. Executive director, director thank you. Um, I should know that after 176 weeks. Um, that's a, so that's a really good question. I don't have the answer to that. And it's part of why uh, the historical society that I'm most involved in, the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, SHEER, um, I keep pushing for ways for university teachers to understand what we can do to help other kinds of teachers in this moment that we're in. Um, you know, I mean, th this is a, a way in which NCHE, if nothing else could, you know, I've seen actually, and I, I'm now speaking like with no knowledge at all. So Jessica, you could totally ignore what I'm saying here, but um, wouldn't it be interesting if in the same way that um, a while back people were, um, creating like guidebooks on how to organize locally. Here are the things you can do to organize locally. If there was some kind of guidebook to um, supporting teachers in other states or some kind of a way of a list or an explanation of things that people can do to help others in other states, even if they're not from that state um, and a, a national organization to do that, um, that would be a fine thing. So AHA is um, doing a session at both NCSS and the AHA conference. So if you're going to either one of those, um, there's a group of us from Virginia who just recently faced this. And while we didn't get everything we wanted, we did push back hard and got some of the things that they were trying to force on us taken out of our revised standards. So we're, we've created it sort of like a case study for others. Like here's what we did that worked and here's what didn't work so well. And here's in hindsight, what we wish we had done earlier sort of a thing. So if you're going to either one of those conferences or afterwards, I will be happy to share the slides with this group. We're, and we're, you, could, we're you know, um, Jessica just said, it's an intriguing idea. Given, given Zoomness, right? You could oh. convene a, a, a group of people from different states and, and at least have an opening conversation about um, what people agree on and what would be the most useful. It would be really, really interesting. We we need to come together as teachers to defend education and each other. Um, and I don't know the answer to the best way to do that. Um, I also wanna repeat, Jennifer says, um, one option is to join AHA uh, and donate to their operational funds so they can continue their advocacy for all history teachers. So um, yep. and yeah. I will say both AHA and NCHE sent letters to the Virginia Board of Education and the boards in other states. They've been doing it for other states that are facing these challenges. 
And at least in Virginia, we were told that having a national organization like that was more impactful than, sad to say, Virginia, people from within Virginia who elected these people or, or elected the people who appointed them. But they actually said when the AHA and the NCHE and national organizations stepped in, that gave them pause to think. I also want to say, Tim, the article that you just posted there, Reconstruction in U.S. History Textbooks from the Journal of American History, 1995, that's the article I was remembering from grad school because it, it came out the year I was, my second year in grad school. So thank you for that. That's one of the things that I was thinking. So, okay. Yeah. All right. That was a good question. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. Laura has a question. She says, is this a counter to the push in around 2010 to have the national standards, you know, the common core and the. And, and that's not something I know a lot about. Annie, you might know more. I, do, I was going to say, I, I, I do believe that was sort of the beginning of their end game in mind, which is to privatize and, and push through more charters and, and uh, siphoning money away from public education into private vouchers and things like that. I do think that that was, and it wasn't just 2010, that started in the 90s with the No Child Left Behind nonsense. So this has been a long game for the people who are of that mindset. And um it's just kind of coming to a head more nasty in the last couple of years. And um, I, I will say something just because in the same way that I have a strong gut response to books and libraries, I have the same response for public education. I am entirely, um, except for college, entirely a product of public education. Uh, and public education is central, the core of American democracy. It is. Um, and so chipping away at public education is a partisan move. It does not help us if we do not come together uh, as Americans in schools to talk and engage. Uh, and again, mix in with other kinds of people, uh, not just private schools with, you know, filtered populations. Um, I, you know, I, I it has happened more than once that I've done some kind of private event and um, someone has come up to me and said, are you a product of public education? Because if you are, I'm really happy. And I'm always very proud to be like, yes, <laughs> I am. And, and, I, and I believe it in public education from the bottom of my heart. If I had kids, they would go to public schools. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, we're a minute past. Okay, we've got a couple of questions if we can squeeze them in. Let's, let's see. If um, we, I have one I'm going to save of Sydney's for the after party. Okay. Uh, Dave is asking as broadband reaches rural America um, and things like Khan Academy, Chat GPT, online libraries, all these digital resources, um, you know, kids that can't get to a library or they take their library away, wouldn't this help? So that that is coming, you know, there's an act that was passed by the Biden administration that has been increasing broadband to many more rural areas. NCHE did an awesome rural America series of um, professional learning over the last couple of years. I was really lucky to participate in some of that. They have a Library of Congress um, section in the, in the teaching primary sources part of the Library of Congress website where they're kind of archiving all that work that NCHE has been doing. Um, if anybody's interested, Jessica, let me know if it's okay to put a link to that. Can people who didn't go to the... So oh, Jessica just said it's still going on. Oh, yeah. yeah the year three is starting in October. So yeah. you see, you can join that if you're a teacher. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the more we open up, that's why we do everything digital where I work at New American History. And that's why a lot of universities are digitizing archives. A lot of historians are working on digital humanities projects more than they ever did before. All of Joanne's... Um, Backstory podcast and you and Heather have an archive, right? For for your yeah. So I think the more we archive, you're right, we get it out there to a lot more people. And kids are finding stuff. Like, you know, go ahead and ban a book. Someone, very someone else is asking if they ban a book in school, could a kid have it taken away from them as a personal copy? I would say that is on a case by case, state by state, school by school, even basis. But it would be harder to take a personal book away if the child's just sitting there reading it during lunch or something, I would think. I just have to say something. Lois, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, just joined. Oh, Lois McMillan. Yay. Grandkids. 
Yeah. That's our theme, I think. Grand grandkid duty. We need um, a grandma mug too, not just a grandpa. History matters yeah. and so do grandmas and so do grandpas. So so are we near being done with the questions or um yeah, I think so. Um is there a yeah. couple of things passed? Yep. Um Sydney had one that I think we can save, and they were also saying that Jennifer's letter in the AHA stream was excellent. Wonderful. So thank you for that. Yeah. All right. We did it. Hey, okay. okay. It's over. So let me describe what comes next. Um, so uh, we are going to be moving on to the after party. What that means is that we will no longer be recording so that we can be even freer and easier with whatever we want to discuss as a group. Um, if you are beaming in, through the NCHE website, website, you can just stay right where you are. But if you are now watching on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and join us at nchteach.org slash conversations. And you go there, find us, and poof, you will be in the after party. Uh, and who knows what we're going to talk about in the after party, because we don't ever know. Um, at any rate, thank you as ever for being here every week to engage in the discussion of democracy, to engage in democracy itself. It matters. It matters to each of us, I know, including me big time. It matters that we do this consistently. It matters that we ask big questions. It matters that we don't always have the answers and we're willing to say that. It matters that we're talking about education and culture and soft topics that are easy to overlook and shouldn't be. Um, Many things matter, as does history. So thank you, as ever, for being here and engaging in this, I want to say work, important work. It's hard to use that word because it's so enjoyable, and this is such an amazing community, but it also should count as, as the work of democracy. So I'll throw that in there as well. Um, thank you, Annie. Thank you, John, um, for making this all possible. Uh, before we head into the after party. Um, and everyone have a good week. Uh, I will see you in a week. Um, I am ignoring the S word about what comes in a few weeks because I'm pretending that summer goes on forever. Um, some of you may be starting the S word. Oh, Jen says, how do I save the chat? I think you go oh, down. Just typing it. Yep. The okay, three good. dots. You click on the three dots and it'll say save chat and it'll save. And there's a lot of great information in this today's chat so um okay if you're anyway. new, we have a slack channel and we archive all of the chats there i put them in about within 10 minutes of logging off usually um and so if you type in slack s-l-a-c-k in all caps and then your first and last name and your email i can add you to our slack group and we stay in touch all week we have a separate teacher's lounge we have a needle arts group in there that formed because we have a lot of very crafty History people. History matters, peeps. Yep. And then we talk about all kinds of stuff during the week until Fridays. So we would love to have you join us. Okay. We will now go to the after party. Hey, wait for the voice. The voice.